you are the guinea pigs for the first time when we've, we've done this. So, um, and um, let's see. So, so the, the structure of this is going to be that you know I will pontificate a little bit about sound in general, and then um, Simone and I will tell you about different sounds of different species. And then we'll have a little break, but before the break, you're going to get your door prize, and your door prize is a USB stick that has software and a little bit of data. And then when we come back from the break, we'll start to actually work with the software and you know learn how to analyze some acoustic data. So, um, so I, I think one of the things that uh, Larson is good at pointing out is the failings of scientists, and especially if you look at the Cartoon, cartoon down in the lower left-hand corner. You know that it's it's painfully obvious that there's some information being transmitted from the animals, but it's painfully obvious that we're not getting it. So, so you know we just um, we're we're listening, but we can't name that tune yet. So, so, um, so here's this sort of sequence, just to kind of dive into this from the view of somebody who's analyzing uh, sound data, and, and it starts out up here with some sound source and this kind of a funny shaped black and white sound source in this case from the perspective of a physicist but but um, so this object makes sound and then the sound propagates through some kind of environment it can be um, kind of complicated but it goes from the, the the source to your receiver and then there are a whole series of steps here and we want to follow this sort of chain of progression of analyzing the data around to where you know there's a happy graduate student that, that produces a publication right? and so but, but the you know to, to get from kind of here to here is, is you know our, our goal uh, this is like a game right you're, you're you know following the, the path to, to success so um, so I'm going to try to sort of go through each of these steps and, and um, anybody who's been in the field and recorded acoustic data you know, some of this is, is obvious and some of it isn't. So, so the first bit is that we have to have some kind of sensor, I mean, a hydrophone, that's going to transduct the, the acoustic energy into a voltage. In other words, it, it takes the sound that's in the ocean and turns it into a, a voltage that then our electronics can convert into a count, actual, you know, numbers that are then going to go into a computer and then, you know, maybe right here is the boundary between what happens out in the field and what happens in the lab, that we organize these bits somehow in our data storage system, you know, maybe put them into files, and, and the, the format that we use for audio files is called X-Wave. It's just a standard uh, wave format. It's a very standard audio format. You can play it on your iPod. Um, but it also has, it's, it's extended to have information about the location you made the recording and you know the, the calibration and all that kind of stuff so then you know you typically sit here you're taking the data off of these files and you're doing some kind of analysis and the software that we're going to introduce to you is called triton and the godfather of triton sean wiggins um, chose not to come today but we'll, we'll maybe in the future you might interact with them as you as you find enhancements to the software and then um, from the analyst, there's output a series of detections or you know parameters that you pick about the calls, and they end up, end up in a database. And part of the rationale for the database isn't just to help you remember you know what you did and have some formal way of analyzing it, but also to make it to where a number of people can all contribute to the same piece of analysis. That you're standardizing you know what it is you're you're picking, and you put it all together so that you can have a team of people uh, work on the data set. The data sets are just too large now, mostly for one person. And then a lightning bolt strikes you to give you an idea of what it all means, and you write it up, and, and you know, your sponsor is happy, and you're happy, and, and life goes on. So, um, so let's look now at um, this, this thing that we call the decibel. And the bell part of decibel comes from Alexander Graham, you know, the guy that invented the, the telephone and other things. And it's a, it's you know, basically by powers of ten, these bells. 
And, and all acousticians know that we have a love-hate relationship with the decibel. The decibel is important because the way we perceive sound is, is in these orders of magnitude. In other words, if, if sound goes up by a factor of 10, we kind of perceive it linearly going up. You know, in other words, so sound going up by 100 is kind of, you know, two steps up from sound at, at one. So, so we have to, to think about the sound in these, in these decibels. And the, the basis of this is the sound pressure level, or SPL. And so I'm going to try to keep the number of equations to a minimum. But, but it's basically a log. Uh, you know, now you're going back to your high school uh, math class, maybe your junior high math class, a log to the base 10 of the pressure that you measured relative to some reference pressure. Now, it turns out that we like to think of things in terms of, of power or energy, so these are always pressure squares. So this square makes it to where the, the basic equation you have to remember in terms of decibels is that it's 20 times the log base 10 of the pressure you measured relative to some reference pressure. And the reference pressure in the ocean is one micropascal, that is, Pascal is a guy's name, French guy, who came up with this pressure unit. A micropascal is a 10 to the minus 6. So, so and the, that is about the, it's a little bit lower than the, the finest sounds that we can detect in the ocean. So it means that, you know, it, the, the decibels sort of go up from, from zero. Okay, so here's this one equation. I'm sorry to hit you with it, but you've got to know what a, a decibel is. And now, it's, that being bad enough, things get more complicated because the, the sounds that we are analyzing are not all the same in terms of how they're presented to you, in terms of their time. So a, a CW, or a continuous wave sound, is one that goes on. It started back in the infinite past, and it's going to go into the infinite future, and it never changes. And there are only two parameters that we need, basically the frequency or the pitch. You know, it, were, it would be the, the note, you know, if you're a, a, a pianist, you know, where you are on the scale. Um, and the amplitude, that is, you know, how, uh, how we perceive the, the intensity or loudness of the sound. Now, so this is the simplest kind of sounds that are just, these are sound like tones. And then there are sounds that come in some sort of periodic sequence. So, you know, if I were to, to clap my hands, right, those are pulses. And so the pulses have an amplitude, and there's a frequency inside the pulse, the same way that this does, but, but there's an interpulse interval. And so, for instance, an echolocating uh, adonacy, there's a certain rate at which it's producing these clicks. So, um, and, and then how long is the click itself? So, so now this, this gets more complicated in terms of the dB because um, in, in, the, in, in these continuous wave tones, what people have, have come to is using something called the root of the mean of the square. So you basically take the square of the signal, so you rectify it so it's all positive, and then take the mean, you know, the square root of the mean level of that signal. So it's about 0.7 of the, of the amplitude. So, so another important point about why you use root mean square for most things is that if you take a spectra of something, out of your spectra comes numbers that are root mean squares. Right? I mean, most people don't realize that when you have some signal and taking the, the spectra of it, the natural thing to come out is an RMS. Well, RMS is really pretty crappy for these pulse sounds because it all depends on how much you're averaging. You can say, I want just the piece where there is sound, or I'm going to average in a longer piece. And there are entire papers where people do tricks, like people who want to characterize the level of an air gun. You can just use the place where the air gun actually exists and get one number, or you could say, oh, I'm going to average over you know, several seconds, and that artificially diminish the level that I'm reporting for my air gun. So it's, it's tricky. So, so at any rate, um, peak to peak is a very common way of, of describing these guys because you're basically picking kind of the highest amplitude and in some largest window you just say what was the highest amplitude sound that we could find and so but if you take zero to peak then that's half of peak to peak so you get minus six dBs out of that or you could take the RMS is about 0.7 times zero to peak so there's another three dBs so how you report the dBs you get different levels so an RMS level is 
something like 9 dB lower than a than a uh, peak to peak level. Okay, now it just gets worse. It's, it's going to get better, but I, I have to say this stuff just because. Um, so, so now, if I've if I've recorded a sound, there's a certain location. So in other words, imagine that um, you know, without the microphone, imagine I'm here and I'm projecting my voice out into the room, and each one of you is a receiver that's listening to my voice. You're each going to experience it at a different amplitude because you're different distances away from me. So if you want to characterize my voice, you have to have a standard in terms of the distance. And so uh, what people have come to is to say, well, I'm going to describe the source as if I were standing one meter away. It's a point source and I'm only one meter away, right? So. So I'm going to adjust the receive level for each of you. You know, we're going to have to figure out what the propagation was to come to where you're sitting one meter away from my mouth. And that's how we would describe the source level. So, so source level has inherently kind of the idea that you knew where the source and the receiver were, and you backed it up to a, a standardized distance. Now, in spectra, so spectra isn't just looking at the sound is kind of a waveform, but it's dividing it up into its component frequencies. So we have these things called power spectra, and so now it's, it's Pascal's except Pascal squares. And inherently, part of this measurement is to say, what bandwidth are we, are we looking at? And there are different standards for signals and for noise. So for noise, you always describe things in bins that are only one hertz wide. For a signal, the standard is to describe it as the full bandwidth of the signal. So if I'm describing the source level of, of a ship, I'm gonna, I can do that in various bands, but a very useful thing is to say, here's the full band over which there's energy to the signal. And so, and then there's a matter of the duration, whether it's a short signal or a long signal. You can change your dBs by basically 10 times the log of the duration. Okay, I think that was probably the most equation-laden part of the talk. And, and you know, people who even worked in acoustics for a long time can screw up what a dB is because they're, they're such different beats. But it's all a matter of what your, your goal is. Do you want to describe what you heard? Do you want to describe the sound at the source? Do you consider the, the sound to be, you know, broadband, you know, noise from everything or just from this particular source? So it's, it's a matter of your goal. But here's an example of what uh, Megan McKinnon did in describing the source levels of ships that she recorded in the Santa Barbara Channel. And she's reporting them now. She, you have to explicitly say, you know, what the, the bandwidth is. So she does it either as octave bands or as third octave bands. This is a throwback to the fact that mammalian hearing works kind of in bands like one third octave bands. She recorded the ships at about three kilometers range. She had to back it up to a one meter range. So she's reporting her units are source level dB, RE, micropascal squared at one meter. And so, so now here's her sound levels for a container ship, sort of almost 180 dBs. Here's a bulk carrier. It's very peaky here at a certain frequency around 100 hertz, 200 hertz, but maybe slightly higher level. Here's a oil tankers. And then you can see how the look, the character of it looks different depending on uh, you know, if you're in octave bands, there's more energy in that band, so the number is higher than it is down here in third octave bands. You see how I can pick something that's maybe 183 at the peak here and only 178 or something here. So, so the bandwidth has determined partly what the level of the dB is. Okay. Um, now, for in this realm of having to propagate, having to say, there was a sound made at a certain place and I'm recording it in somewhere else. Um, the first thing that happens is that if I, if you make a sound at a certain place, you know, there, imagine a sphere of energy around where my finger is clicked and that energy expands out in all directions. And so the density of the energy is going down from the, from the place where I made the sound. And describing how that density of energy goes down is in this equation which is, is called spherical spreading, basically, which is saying that the loss of the sound goes as 20 times the log base 10 of the range. So, so for every, if, if I record the sound at one meter, if I then look at the sound at, at 10 meters away, 
it's it's 20 dBs lower in amplitude, right? Because of this spreading of the sound in, in, in all directions. And, and this is always your best guess for what's happening in terms of how to propagate the sound from one place to another, with the caveat that it certainly is the case for what happens when you're close, and it's a really good estimate also for low frequency sounds and not so good for high. Now, the other thing that comes into play is that the media itself will absorb energy, and this is called attenuation. And so now, instead of the 20 log r equation, we've added this bit called alpha r, where alpha is telling us how this, the energy is being absorbed as a function of frequency. And it's a very steep function of frequency. So here's a curve of, for sound absorption in seawater uh, made by um, my colleague at SIO, Fred Fisher. Um, and this goes from you know, different frequencies along the bottom axis from 10 hertz, here's 100 kilohertz up here, and now this alpha is in dBs per kilometer. So, so let's pick a nice number, let's say down here at 100 hertz. We're getting 10 to the minus three, so that's a thousandth of a dB per kilometer. So you have to go a thousand kilometers to absorb even one dB, which is not much. So, so the answer here is, at low frequencies, there's almost no attenuation. Everything, there is geometrical spreading, but there's no attenuation. Now, let's go to 100 kilohertz. Here, we go way up this curve, all the way up here, to let's say maybe it's about 30 dBs per kilometer. So if I go three kilometers, there's 90 dBs. That's huge. So the signals at 100 kilohertz attenuate and don't, they just can't propagate very far. Signals at 100 hertz can go forever. They can cross the ocean. Say, so, John? Yes. So what happens when you take an ocean that has particles in it, like plankton? How do, how do <laughs> particles alter the frequency dependence of the so alpha? Of they, the are, they are scatterers. And the most efficient scattering is when the wavelength is approximately matched to the scale of the object that's doing the scattering. So for your critters, little guys like this, let's say you know a, a centimeter, then there are frequencies kind of uh, up in here, you know, tens of kilohertz or whatever. Well, 15 kilohertz would be 10 centimeters. So 20, 30 kilohertz or whatever. There's a lot of scattering, and that is an additional factor of diminishing the sound that you see. Now, you of course use that as a backscatter to detect the presence of the critters. So you like the fact that they scatter, right? But if you're looking at it as a way of just propagating energy through the media, it's dissipating it, you know, by by scattering. Right, so, so the three things we've talked about now, geometrical spreading, intrinsic absorption, attenuation, and scattering. Right. So I, I try to keep this as simple as possible, but. Uh, okay, so here's a curve that shows how much attenuation you expect, and each of these blue curves is a different frequency, and as a function of range. And so a straight line kind of the straight sort of slopey line would be where everything is spreading and there's no attenuation. And so at 300 hertz, that's more or less the case. As far as you want to go, this line is more or less straight. But at 100 kilohertz, you can see the line turns down pretty rapidly. And if you're going much more than a kilometer, there's a lot of absorption. Right? So this tells you why uh, critters that make sound at 100 kilohertz, like you know, porpoises, they're not echolocating on things that are very far away. Whereas a blue whale that's, that's singing at you know 15 hertz or whatever, that can propagate forever. So, um, okay, and then the other bit is when the sound interacts with the boundaries of the ocean, like under the ice in the Arctic, or in shallow water bouncing against the surface and the bottom, then there's an additional component of, of, of you know multiple paths to go from the source to the receiver, but also opportunities to absorb the energy. Okay, and then there's a lot of work the Navy has put into coming up with computer models to propagate sound. And so these are three different computer codes, but they're really pretty similar in their outputs. Imagine there's a source right here, um, and then this, there's a, sh a wedge of, of, of uh, the sediment coming up, and here's the sea surface, and the sound is basically bouncing between the bottom and the surface. And so you get these kind of bright spots and dark spots 
as you get constructive and destructive interference. But but these these codes exist, and even you know they're they're relatively simple to, to run. I was going to say even a biologist can run them. Right? And, uh, <laughs> 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 um, okay, so now let's switch to, to look at hydrophones. And so um, here is this bit is just a blow up of the hydrophone that we have in the harps, and um, and so there are the sensors themselves. These ceramic elements, so they literally are ceramics, like, it's like a pot, you know, someone's taking clay and fired a pot, and it's just, it's a particular kind of pot, it's, it's made up of lead zircon titanate as a powder, and you fire like a pot, and then you, um, you put electrical connections on it, and so it's, it's a piezoelectric, which means that if you squeeze it and deform it, then it, a voltage appears, or conversely, if you apply a voltage, it will deform to make a sound. Now, um, right away, the, the, the voltages that these put out are very small, microvolt kind of thing at normal sound levels. And so right away, we want to have an amplifier to boost the electrical signal, hopefully not adding you know, very much noise, and then send that on to some kind of uh, thing that's going to actually write down the, the voltage. So, so here's one of the hydrophones we've put together. It's in oil because the properties of oil are much like water, so the sound can propagate through the oil to, to reach the sensor, but the oil is non-conducting, so it protects the electronics. Oh, and, and you'll notice that there's kind of a spherical thing here. That's actually our high-frequency transducer. And then there's a bigger ring of, of transducers here that we use for low frequency. Now, because in the harp, anyway, we're trying to go over extremely broad band, we have to have these two sensors to cover the full bandwidth. But now, from the manufacturer, the International Transducer Corporation in Santa Barbara, um, they've, act, they've come up with a calibration which tells us the sensitivity of the hydrophone versus frequency. And so it's a slightly wiggly curve, but it's approximately minus 200 dB RE volt per micropascal. So in other words, for every micropascal, which is an exceedingly small pressure that's applied to the surface of the transducer, it puts out minus 200 dB volt, which is 10 to the minus 10 volts, a small number. You know, 0.1 uh, nanovolt. So, so at any rate, here's our calibration. It came, comes from the, the manufacturer. Now, you can see what happens is it's kind of flat, and then it peaks here at 80, 90 kilohertz, and then it kind of goes away. And so this transducer is spec to work to about 100 kilohertz, right, and then not um, above that. For the low frequency, um, we put in, we have six of these guys, these AQ1s, and you can see they get kind of flaky here above about 10 kilohertz, and, and they really go away above about 20. We use them for a band um, down below about 2 kilohertz, and we put a whole bunch of them together to get a, a beefier signal. So, so the next bit is we have to have an amplifier, and this is our, our preamp where we just look at a voltage in and a voltage out, and you say what the gain of the amplifier is. That's, that's how much boost does it give the signal, and in this case, it's about 50 dBs of boost for the low frequency bit and, and a kind of similar thing for the high frequency bit. So you add that to the transducer sensitivity, and out comes a curve that tells you that if I apply a pressure to the hydrophone, what voltage will come out? And so now you can see this is about minus 155 dB RE uh, volt per micropascal. So, now the next bit is, let's let's do a little calculation. And so, here's our friend Shamu, and um, he has just put out a signal at 220 dB RE micropascal at one meter. Right? We had our head a meter away from him. We hear this 220 dB. Now, our receiver is actually a kilometer away. So, <clears throat> we take our crop loss curve here, and I'm going to pick off the point at one kilometer, and I know that it's pretty much right on 60 dB, because at, at oh, and it, by the way, he's doing this at, at uh, 10 kilohertz, let's say. So the 10 kilohertz curve more or less follows the geometric spreading up to this point. So I'm, I now have minus 60 dBs. So this gives me a prediction that at one kilometer range, I have a 160 dB signal that's going to be falling on the hydrophone. Right? So now the next bit is, 
and this is where I've made it very easy. Um, if it's a 160 dB signal at the hydrophone, and the sensitivity of the phone is minus 160, so that's this point I picked off right here, and there's a weird coincidence of plus 160 minus 160 equals zero. So our predicted output of the hydrophone is zero dB RE volts, you know, which zero dB means it's going to put out one volt. Right? So the, the math so far is, is easy. So now we've got an A to D converter. So we know our A to D converter has a certain number of bits. It says 16 bits, and I'm going to make its voltage output 10 volts. So 16 bits is 65,000 counts at 10 volts. So therefore, one volt is 6,554 counts. So our analyst now, from the click that was made, you know, at 220 dBs, on the screen will be a wiggle that goes from zero to 6554. So now, why is that useful? Aha! Now, going backwards here, having done this, the analyst who sees a click at 6554 counts output can then say, aha, I know, having measured that it was a kilometer away, that Shamu just put out a click at 220 dBs. In other words, I've just gone backwards along this chain to tell you what the source level was of the, of the, the sound. Why do you know it's a kilometer away, John? Because uh, a, a biologist with radicals, <laughs> that, or I had multiple sensors that localized the sound in space by some kind of triangulation. Now, um, let's say that just this is just a, a test. This, this, here's another factor. I'm, I'm not going to you know, tax you too much or whatever, but we know that, that this number is a tenth of the maximum output, right? How loud would Shamu need it to have clicked to get to where we were just clipping the system? How many more dBs would Shamu need it to have made this, this click so that this would actually be at the maximum? You know, in other words, there's a signal of interest that's so loud it clips the system. What, what is that dB over here? Whoever could get this. 240. 240, Jay. Jay's my plan. <laughs> Everybody got that? So, so you see, by making this 240, we're 20 dBs up now, right? Well, 20 dBs is a factor of 10, so we're just clipping. Okay, so, so now here's the second question. Jay doesn't get to answer this, right? How much closer, making the same source level, would Shamu need to be to clip? Right now, he's at a kilometer. How much closer does he come to our hydrophone where he starts to clip? Now, you remember that the key equation, 20 log r. Factor of 10, he's at a kilometer. What's a factor of 10 closer? 100 meters. So at 100 meters, the received level, the source level would go up, but the received level would be 20 dBs higher. So then this would click. Right. So that's another factor. So with this setup that we have, which is kind of more or less what we actually have in the field, and 220 is not a bad number for what orcas do, any orca that's closer than 100 meters is going to clip our system. Right. That's just the way it is. It's, we need more dynamic range to have that not happen. OK. Um, <laughs> I, I shudder to, to ask for questions, but how much? How am I doing? I'm, I take my I take my half hour.